Hello! And welcome to Lit by Moonlight, where it's not a phase for it to make sense dramaturgically. And it's not a phase to have to split your entire breakdown of succession into two parts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not a phase. We just have that much to talk about. We may even have four seasons of this in us. Who knows? <laughs> Who's to say? <laughs> I'm Caitlin, and I own a ludicrously capacious bag. And I am Emberlyn, and I am always just one mental breakdown away from faxing Kieran Calkin my home address. Okay, so Caitlin, we're going to pick up where we left off. So I think I think this would actually be a really good time for us to talk in greater depth about the finale. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want to know, like, what would you say, what say you to someone who expected a happy ending for the Roy kids? I would say, did you watch the show? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you did you really think that they were like one of them was going to like come out on top going into the finale? I was like this person can have this person and this person can have this and everything will work out and it'll all be fine. But then at the same time being like, but also none of them are going to get it. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I think if you expected a happy ending for the Roy kids, you're an optimist and I respect that about you, but it just was never going to happen. And I really don't know if like it would have been a good ending if it turned out well for them. You know? Like I yeah. feel like I, I, we call it a, a tragedy, and that's because it is, and it's because, like, th- this was always going to happen. There was nothing that was going to change it, you know? Like, yeah. I have no bad things to say about the finale because I loved it, and I think it made sense dramaturgically, <laughs> and I wouldn't change a thing about it. <laughs> I know we talk about this a lot, um, but it remains relevant that whatever you would expect from a show like Succession, not in practice, but maybe in its basic features, is not what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Like, this is just not that show, and it is one of the few shows that is effortlessly not that show. I think it's really rare to watch original content that is unexpected in a way that isn't, like, kind of, kind of, like, degrading. Like, sometimes in television, you get thrown a plot twist, and it's, like, a real got-ya moment, but Mm -hmm. it feels like the creator's think that show's success is entirely based on whether or not the viewer can anticipate what will happen next and that's just not true because I feel like predictability isn't a bad thing necessarily in execution so a lot of times attempts at unpredictability or like shock value feel very misplaced or like the showrunners are like trying too hard to be like got ya you know Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so this is one of the few shows that I think executes unpredictability effortlessly. Like I think I don't feel like I don't feel like anyone is trying to pull the wool over my eyes when something unexpected happens in this show or like mm-hmm. make me feel stupid. Um and I also feel like the show obviously um I think defies a lot of clichés about what is supposed to happen in a family drama. I would agree with you that I think a clear cut happy ending for any of the Roy children or specifically for Kendall would have been deeply unsatisfying when you consider the fit for a king scene, for example, mm-hmm. which I think is like the final grasp at something resembling love before it all falls apart. Yeah. Um, because if it hadn't fallen apart, it wouldn't have been as interesting. But it all I think it also just wouldn't have been as satisfying as people want to believe it would have. I'll talk in a moment about why I wanted Kendall to have it really badly. But Mm -hmm. how, in retrospect, I don't think that would have done much for me or anyone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like that it's really up to the eye of the beholder to interpret who, quote unquote, wins at the end of this show. And I I, Mm -hmm. I think that that's what makes it good. I think um, you mentioned the Meal Fit for a King scene. Watching it, it was so lovely and so sweet because, like, I love all of the moments between the Roy siblings where they're actually just being siblings who love each other because yeah. it happens so rarely so but like even watching it I was like you know this is the last this is as good as it's gonna get and this is not gonna last and it was so sad which mm-hmm. I feel like just makes the ending of it all like it that holds more importance knowing how it ends and it it's such good writing and it hurts me oh that's me getting stabbed <laughs> off camera um or off 
off the mic, I guess. Speaking of the ending and how you mentioned how you really wanted Kendall to have it all, why did you want Kendall to have it all? Oh, I mean, I think it was really in like an eldest daughter, Michael Bluth sort of way. Like <laughs> Michael Bluth. You watch this pathetic man struggle and struggle and struggle and you kind of feel bad for him, which is like a weird and surprising thing to say about an unethical person. Mm -hmm. Um, But I wanted his win toward the end almost as much as I think he wanted his win. And when he didn't get it, it devastated me personally. (laughs) Um, And I took that personally. Yeah, I did take it personally. And that's the extent (laughs) that... I thought it was, like, the wrong move, obviously, Mm -hmm. um, per my previous statements. But when I say personally, I mean that there's something very relatable about Kendall, which is a weird thing to say about a very unethical person. But, like, I know people will say, but Amberlynn, whatever do you mean? He's a rich (laughs) white man. He's, like, a sexist, whiny boy fiend who (laughs) commutes via heli and loves cocaine. How is that relatable? But I think that's, like, a very – I think to even ask that is reductive. The wealth – is very obviously not the relatable part for (laughs) the majority of the viewing public. To me, it's really the humanity. It is, and I don't say humanity in like the, he's just a guy, we should like feel bad for him and let him have his money and his toys type of way. Mm -hmm. But it is. It is his pitifulness that is relatable. All he does in this show is try and fail and try and fail to beat his father. And he is so weak and yep. he has these moments of coherence where he's playing the game and winning followed by long stints of stagnancy and, and, and cringe and it's <laughs> hilarious but it's also the most understandable thing about him an example of this is like there is a lot of discourse about gallows humor and whether it dehumanizes the deaths of the ocean gate titan passengers and i disagree i i personally think that irony I personally okay I just heard a noise so I think they're ghosts might be trying to kill me but it's okay um maybe I should (laughs) (laughs) something in this room said say less so maybe I shouldn't say this but I'm gonna say it (laughs) I personally think the irony of this happening (laughs) is deeply humanizing because we often equate wealth with unrivaled intelligence and yet the ordeal of taking an unsafe submersible to the bottom of the ocean for a ridiculous amount of money is in itself the dumbest thing ever. To like, the Titanic. Yeah. Yeah, to the to the fucking <laughs> to the fucking Titanic. Like and, and and I think there's something very like if you don't think Kendall Roy would do that, like do you know him? Because that is that is that is that is he. He mm-hmm. is that. Like mm-hmm. You know, so who did you want to win, Caitlin? In the beginning of the show, I also very, very much wanted it to be Kendall. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there was a time where I was like, oh, but it should be Shiv. But I also kind of Mm -hmm. knew, like, in the back of my mind, like, it's never going to be Shiv. Like, you just knew that was going to be too good to be true. If you're a woman, you know it's not going to be Shiv. Yeah, you know it's not going to (laughs) happen. You're like, no. (laughs) This isn't for me, thanks. But also, like, kind of like season two onward i was rooting for roman because like in this season two finale i'm pretty sure it's season two finale or towards the end of season two he has to go somewhere and make a a deal what the deal is i don't remember but it's very important business 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 it's very much like he is in control he's in charge of a big important business thing and he comes back and he and whoever he's with are on this boat with logan and they're and the one guy is just like it's gonna be great it's gonna be awesome and then Mm -hmm. roman's like actually i don't think this is real and he gives like a really well thought out answer and like everything he was saying like made sense to me like the things that he was doing for the company he was just doing it well and i feel like even moving forward there are so many times where roman showed so much of like how it could be him like yeah. it, je- like I really believed. Like if someone just gave him the time of day, if he was able to move on from not being controlled by Logan in the way that he was, I mean, this is gonna take a lot because there's a lot of trauma there. But like, if he could just get out of his dad's, not even like shadow, but like grasp, because Logan, he, like he was the one, he was the weakest link, and Logan knew it. Like there was so many times where Logan's just like, I'm gonna get to Roman, and that's how I get my way. Like, at least Mm. I have one of my kids. And it was always going to be Roman because Roman was always easiest to grab and manipulate. Mm -hmm. But, like, 
you start to see Roman start to question that and to really like side with his siblings and to go against Logan. And there were just so many times, especially when he was paired up with Jerry, where I'm just mm. like, you could have it all. Like you could, you could be at the top, if not CEO, then at least like somewhere next to it, <laughs> like like co CEO. I don't know. I was just like, I really felt like he could do it, and I was always, always rooting for him. Mm. Always. I think he's probably, and it's weird to say this because he is horrifying, but he's also oh yeah enough like one of the most interesting and like most likable characters because yeah. Speaking of gallows humor, I think he is probably the, the most charming of mm-hmm, mm-hmm. anyone. I think he's the closest to, like, saying what what needs to be said. It, which, when I say saying what needs to be said, I'm talking about, like, the rhetoric that Logan would use, which was a little different than, like, the, the corporate jargon, the what are the optics, you know? Yeah. Um, and actually the video essay that I was talking about earlier talks a lot about like how Logan's rhetoric is very different than the corporate jargon. It's like, Mm -hmm. but, but it's like almost like cruel honesty. It's bluntness. Um, Yeah. And Roman has that. (laughs) Which, which, which Roman has. And I think it's important to recognize that that's another, just another form of jargon, just like a Mm -hmm, less mm -hmm. like corporate one. And like, I think I think the this essayist was talking about how like one of the primary motivators for the 2016 election was like a lot of people liked that the Republican candidate Donald Trump had I can't believe I just said that like I just introduced him as the Republican candidate <laughs> as, as if, if no one wouldn't knew. have fucking like <laughs> known that this all Who happened to us um, the guy from Home Alone yeah so. Um, <laughs> And, like, a lot of voters said that they liked that he, quote-unquote, tells it like it is. Mm. And this is something that I think that people, like, when you have politicians who have, like, a certain way that they speak, and it's all very coded, and it's all kind of lying, um, when someone comes in and starts speaking differently and in a way that mimics honesty, it feels refreshing. And obviously, right. there's, like, a lot of horrific, like... The, the the definition of truth here is racist and misogynistic and very disturbing and is very much tied to people's internal biases about things they don't know or care about or understand or people they don't know or care about or understand. But, like, that's Roman, and I think that's what makes him palatable mm-hmm. to a lot of people, and that's why he's the most personable um, of right. the, the three. And, like, that's his skill set, and that's what he inherited from his father, and it works really right. well. I also like what you said about how, like, there's at different points during every season you kind of like wanted different people to have it or like yeah. thought different people were going to get it because that's exactly what happens like there are, mm-hmm. I kept changing back and forth so many times um yeah just because of the way that each Roy kid pulled me in yeah it's crazy how like it happened because like it's, it's another one that's like before you even know it you're rooting for another person it's like wait when yeah. did I stop rooting for Kendall instead of rooting, yeah. rooting for Shiv like when, when did I fall in love with Shiv when? Oh, yeah exactly <laughs> in terms of who you thought was going to win versus who you wanted to win i thought um i first of all i had a lot of insane theories about who i thought was going to win um (laughs) yeah i was convinced it was going to be kendall or shiv um and i was like it was to the point where i was like just weighing the utility of either winning but my thought process was very much like okay kendall like if he got it it would be satisfying if you wanted kendall to win if you had my internal bias of wanting that Mm -hmm. and Shiv is I feel like she the move she was making with Matson, you know like the power that she held as a board member made me think it could have been her and like for her to have gotten it after being stepped on by her brothers so many times would have been like poetic justice but we have to remind ourselves again and again that's not that show right right yeah um and I don't think like there's a part of me that I think didn't like, even though before the series finale we would talk about this you and i and i'd be like it's just not that show when we talk about mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. the possibilities um i don't think i fully understand it until it was over until i knew you know yeah um so the choice of tom to win it's both a curse and a blessing a blessing because shiv can uppercut him and take influence possibly but we'll never really know and mm-hmm. a curse because she could very well always be a kingmaker and never a king right. and it's again it's all up to interpretation what happens from that point on yeah. So no spinoffs. I will no spinoffs. Someone. Nothing. I <sighs> be like so bad. Oh, I HBO. I don't, I'm in your walls for different reasons than usual. Max, get Max. over here. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Sansa 
the name of a fucking dog. There should be another streaming service called Ruby. Oh my god, there should. And it's gonna be ours, and we're gonna own it. <laughs> and then one Next of us is gonna die, Ruby. and one of our weird kids is gonna try to take it over. <laughs> Ruby and Max. Uh, who did you think was going to get it? It was hard, because like I said, I kind of went back and forth, and I really didn't think... I wanted Roman to win, because mm-hmm. I thought that it would kind of be like a, kind of like an underdog pick like no yeah. one would ever suspect roman and i wouldn't it be great if he actually won like actually and in a way to me i feel like he kind of did win in the end because he got mm-hmm. out yeah. um and he's free and that's all i ever want for him and um so like obviously i really wanted him i didn't actually think it might go that way i for a while was thinking like I knew that all of the kids like had to lose somehow, but I was kind of thinking that like Jerry, Frank, mm. and Carl would kind of come out on top. Mm. The three as, witches. Like, the three witches of Macbeth, you know, <laughs> like kind of like they're there, and then like all of a sudden like it doesn't it doesn't matter what the kids want, like it's gonna be these people who have been in the business for forever. And then I didn't really like I thought about Tom, but I never really thought about him winning until and like I really don't want to take credit for this because like. I like I I tried I <laughs> I tried so hard. What? <laughs> you just, the headline for this is gonna be like, Caitlin takes credit for the success. Caitlin <laughs> takes credit for no, but like watching this show, I like you and I would talk a lot about it, and I would like talk to you as I was watching it. Like I don't want to theorize about what's gonna happen mm-hmm. because one, it won't be as good as what's actually gonna happen, and two. This show really is unpredictable, as you were talking about. Like, it, it it's not, like, predictable, like, shock value, as in, like, oh, my God, I can't believe you did that. And the writer's mm-hmm. like, haha, you can't believe that we did it. It's just, like, everything that happened, like, I think about it now, having watched the series as a whole, and it, re- like, it really did make sense dramaturgically. <laughs> like, it really, like, <laughs> like, it is, like, yeah, of course that happened. Of course it happened like that. So when Tom eventually wins... I was like, oh my god, of course, but also, like, days before the finale aired, I saw this TikTok, and I'll try and find it and link it. This girl was talking about how, like, where the, like, the names come from within the show, and they're talking about, um, Wom's Gams, and Mm. how there was a baseball player who did, I can't remember exactly, but ultimately, he got, like, three people out in one go, is basically what happened, and so, obviously, that's Tom getting... Kendall, Shiv, and Roman out in one fell sweep. So, or swoop. So, yeah. uh, I was just like, oh my God, that'd be crazy if that's what happens. And that's exactly what happened. And it just like, to me, I'm like, that's such a good little thing that the writers did. This is like, here's like a little, like, if you know, you know. Yeah. And it was there from the beginning. And it's just like, it was incredible. I think the finale was great. I think it's incredible what happened. I love that the kids didn't win because. Of the tragedy of it all, the fact that Tom came out on top, and you don't know quite how that's going to go. Like, is Shiv going to be in control of him? Like, we don't know. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to know. I don't want to know, because sometimes it's okay that things are left up to interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I feel like... I, I'm like, I feel like I'm still basking in the, the fact that we witnessed this. Like, yeah, I have a lot of envy for like, I don't know older generations that witness like the finale of the sopranos or like mm-hmm. you know whatever amazing television shows were airing that everyone is watching at once breaking bad because if i didn't watch those shows live this will probably be the first show that i've watched live that has had that level of prestige mm-hmm. um at the time that it aired and i'll talk more about that in a little bit but while this show i would argue doesn't necessarily glorify the wealthy I think that it does have a glorious score. Um, hey, oh, yeah. So I want us to talk a little bit about that now. What is your all-time favorite theme from Succession, Caitlin? <laughs> so um, I actually, like, just a couple days ago, um, I sent Emberlyn my Recedify w- for the month, which, if you don't know, it's like a little thing. Um, that uses your Spotify to tell you like your top 10 tracks of the month and it looks like a little receipt mm-hmm. and literally half of it was a succession dress soundtrack yeah. <laughs> because I am a mentally well human being yeah um, I think so so I have quite a few um, on Dante and C minor huge fave of mine 
Um, I even started learning it on piano because awesome. one, it's one of the easier ones, <laughs> but uh, uh, it's also what my dad and I like to call the Succession Death March because it almost Ooh. always plays, and it's hilarious that it's starting to thunder now. So I don't know if that's gonna pick up, but the second I said Death March, there was like a huge boom. Awesome! <laughs> I was like, yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, paid but actor. it always, yeah, paid actor, the thunder. It always comes on when shit starts to go down, and the slow build up is great. I love a build up into something especially when it like the theme comes in every time it gets me i adore it uh i also love allegro in c minor uh it's mm. very good the high strings that come in that reflect the theme mm. i'm dominating a shareholders meeting as we speak big high strings um, really yeah literally but i think my very 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 favorite is andante moderato the end credits that's also titled amen uh it plays at the end of season three uh, at the very end of the finale and the end credits to the episode. My God, I will never forget it. I will never forget just staring at the screen with my jaw on the floor as the credits start rolling and this plate. It is so good. But also, I feel like we can't not talk about how hard the opening theme goes. Like, mm. I, um, we are a watch the intro household. Uh, we don't skip intros here. Mm. And if you do, you need to be let out of my house um very quickly because we just don't do that (laughs) it's part of the show it sets the mood you know but this one in particular i like if i ever skipped it please like know that i need to be sent straight to jail (laughs) um because i could never ever ever skip this intro no matter how many times i hear it it makes me like bounce up and down because i'm just so excited to hear it every time it comes on i'm like yeah let's go succession um and my very favorite would be like as like the first scene is playing in the show you would slowly start to hear like the drum hits and like the Mm. piano start to come in like at the end of the opening scene and then all of a sudden it'd be like boom as like yeah. as like the theme hits, it it gets me every time. It gives me chills every time. I love it so much, and I've more than once listened to this soundtrack on my way to work, notably on my way to a corporate event. <laughs> and I will say, it does make me feel like a boss ass bitch. The drum hits, yeah. There's like something about it. Like when it comes up on my Spotify shuffle, um, mm-hmm. it's like whoa. Um, there's a Pusha T remix of, uh, the, uh, theme and, oh my God, the lyrics are, the lyrics, woof, but like, um, sometimes that'll come on and it's just like, oh shit, like, (laughs) yeah, unreal, unreal, probably, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it, I'll say it, um, (laughs) oops, greatest theme of all time. Yeah, 100%. Sorry. Greatest theme of all time. What about Star Wars? No. Sorry, John Williams. No. Love you. Love you, honey. But no. Nicholas this Patel is, or bust. This is it. This is it. Sorry. And Dante Resoluto stays heartbreaking, <laughs> stays iconic, stays tragic, stays devastating. Mm-hmm. Um, Runner up is Eulogy for Orchestra, uh, which makes me really sad. Um, yeah. POV. I'm crying because my 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 girl boss besties on Succession are mourning their father's death. Um, <laughs> the score for the show, I think, I want to say that it wouldn't be the same show without it at all. True. By mm-hmm. any means. Like, I can't even imagine what would exist in its place, but I don't think anything would be as good. And I just don't think it would be as good of a show without its score. Right. Caitlin, we love the score. Um, we think that Nicholas Bertel deserves a meal fit for a king. Mm-hmm. What character on the show also deserves a meal fit for a king? Meal fit um, for a king. I know I said, like, earlier that, oh, like, you start rooting for this person, that person. But the, there was one constant for me mm-hmm. um, throughout the show. <laughs> and I've already spoke about him. And that is Roman fucking Roy. I love him so much. He had me from his first line from episode one, which was, what's up, motherfuckers? <laughs> and I was just like, yep, there he is. My new favorite Borbo, if you will. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's just my soft spot for characters who are all bubbly and jokey on the outside, but are actually using that persona to mask the trauma and pain they feel on a daily basis on the inside. 
Um, that did not help me not fall for Roman. He, yes, he's so, so funny. And yes, he's also literally the worst. But I feel like there was so much actual growth with him. Maybe there wasn't growth for him. Maybe I'm just like misremembering things. <laughs> like To me, I just feel like you see him open up like so much and start to grow like even within the company of like where you, at one point I genuinely thought like oh my god he could actually do this like he could win it also I think just because of like the nature of his childhood and also the fact that like he was the one who was used and abused the most by Logan even in his adulthood like I was just like you deserve everything like in the world like you should you should be able to like win like I loved his like pairs up with Jerry like I felt like him like when he was with Jerry like they could have done so much together and I think they could have gone really far within the company like I just felt like as awful as it was it was they were also low-key a good team so um Roman 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 is my favorite is your favorite Roman <laughs> no <laughs> why do you ask <laughs> Who was your favorite? Who would you make a meal fit for a king? Well, he already had one, but I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm a Kendall girl. I so yeah. probably Kendall. Um, mm-hmm. There's just something about his patheticness that is so baby girl <laughs> to me. Like, that's like a line that somebody's going to recover one day for like a transcript of this podcast when <laughs> there's like a new wave of people after. His patheticness know. really captivated me. Yeah. Um, and it does. I feel like I've already talked at great lengths about, like, why I have, like, a special place in my heart for Kendall. But mm-hmm. I just think Jeremy Strong, as an actor, showed up constantly in this show. I know he's, like, a method actor, mm-hmm. which is unhealthy. But I I felt really drawn to his portrayal of Kendall. I felt like mm-hmm. he really captured the uh, shell of a person that Kendall yeah. is. There is such a numbness about him, like the, his facial expressions, how easy it is to like literally screen cap him and be like <laughs> just overlay a, with a caption that's like, when you remember that your mom likes your sister more than you or something insane like that you know like which is like that was a really person that sounded like a really personal one but that's not that doesn't i promise that doesn't apply to me i don't think that about my own sister but um i actually think the opposite (laughs) yeah i loved him but then honorable mention for shiv um Mm -hmm. She's my foul wife through and through i love how difficult she made life for herself all the time real (laughs) <laughs> and I love that she was insane, and I love that she was a self sabotager. I love that about. I just love all of that. Like they checked all my boxes, you know. And I also love that this show made it so difficult for me to choose between them, as I'm sure it was very difficult for Logan, or maybe he just literally did not give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> there were so many characters that we loved, but so many characters that are honestly kind of the worst. And we love them for it anyway. However, who is the character that you think is an inhuman fucking dog man? (laughs) Um, (laughs) Well, I mean, I think it goes without saying, though I'm going to say it anyway. Logan is horrifying, undoubtedly. He is is perhaps one of the most believable abusers that I've ever, like, watched be portrayed on television. I feel like Mm -hmm. a lot of times media can really fail to capture the true nature of an abuser. And I feel like some people don't know how to write an abuser if thus they've lived with one so if as anyone on the writing staff who needs like a big hug uh <laughs> i am passing one along to you because mm-hmm. i just felt i felt like i just felt like logan was exactly that there are often a lot of layers missing for in the portrayal of abusive parents it's always like <laughs> Like a guy in a flannel shirt and he storms into the house with a beer bottle and the protagonist's flashback and uh he's like i hate you and then he like hits someone and then he leaves and that's the extent of that and that's not to say that that horrifying thing does not happen but that that is literally not the only thing that happens right um and that i mean like it's the that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to like abuse and like how enmeshed we become with our abusive parents 
as children and how that follows us throughout our adult lives. Logan to me is the encapsulation of all of the things that make up an abuser. And it's obviously every person has a different experience with an abuser, but like he's charming, he's emotionally and physically violent, he's cruel, and yet he's well respected. He's very popular. Um, uh -huh. He's also super manipulative, which kind mm -hmm. of explains the popularity. In her eulogy, um, Siobhan talks about how when he let you in, the sun shone and it was warm in the oh. light. And yeah. oftentimes you'll see that line compared to the scene where he asks her if she wants it, if she wants to be the successor. And, ah, uh, like, I feel so sad for her because... It was never going to be her. Like, it was yeah. never going to be her. Never, ever. And even when you're watching that scene, I think, as a viewer, you know that. And it it hurts, you know? It's like, oh, yeah. my God, you know? Um, and it's like, each season, he kind of does this. He, like, chooses one of them to groom. And, and mm -hmm. that's exactly what he is. He's a groomer. Yeah. And it's mm -hmm. disturbing. And when he's done grooming them, he throws them all out because... Um, I think he realizes they're nothing. They're not serious people. And <laughs> it's by far the most nuanced depiction of an abuser that I've ever really seen. Um, I yeah. think, like, there are times when, like, recently where films have come close, I think, as we start talking more about abuse and its long-term effects on younger people, but, like, parental abuse. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then runner-up is definitely Greg because he's just, like, a leechy little guy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, I have to agree with you, uh, Logan. There, I mean, I would hate characters multiple for multiple reasons throughout the show, but the constant was Logan for mm -hmm. obvious reasons and everything that you just said. Like he groomed his children to live in this world um, that he created for them, but then he's also like is mad at them because they had it better than he did at their age like mm -hmm. no that's not how it should be but it was a really interesting dynamic and horrible dynamic to watch so um yeah he was kind of the worst when marcia says in an earlier season like he built you a playground yep i yep. always like and then yeah wow and then when he later you a playground and you thought it was the world yeah you thought it was the world and then later on when she comes back to sh to shift at the at the um the funeral or not the yeah the mm. funeral and she says like he broke your hearts and he broke mine too mm. Mm. yeah mm. hey much to think about stop <laughs> <laughs> so which character are you the most hopelessly in love with even though we mm. kind of already did this listen it's not it's not that i'm in love with him maybe it is it's it's that i wanted him <laughs> so fucking bad that's right i'm talking about that culkin boy <laughs> I, I would like to eat the bracelets off his wrist Real. this man is i uh hmm huh what do we do help uh-oh you know i i don't know in our um document you say in all caps it takes up about two pages woof 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 woof, woof bark 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 and honestly, I couldn't have said it better myself. And one meow at the very end. Don't forget that. <laughs> and one meow. Oh, I'm so sorry. Honorable mention for Jerry. I'm so in love with you. Please come back to me, mommy. Real. How about you? Yeah. No, uh, same. I couldn't have said it better myself. That Culkin boy. That Culkin boy. <laughs> and Jerry. I fucking love Jerry so much. Uh, that, they have, wow. Speaking of Jerry and Roman. Yeah. Um, who was your favorite ship? Yeah, Roman and Jerry. Roman oh. and, like I remember texting you and being like, Roman and Jerry? <laughs> I was like, what's going on? And now I'm like, Roman and Jerry, yeah. <laughs> like, mm. I genuinely don't think that they could ever have like a real relationship, nor do I think they should. But at the same time, I think for me as a as a Roman girly, like I was just happy that he had someone stable in his life that would like talk to him and like actually hear him out, but also wouldn't put up with his shit, mm -hmm. but also be there for him. And so when they lost that, it hurt me so bad. <laughs> There's something about a masochist with mommy issues and his mommy. Yeah, the truth That's is all. something. Um, Who's yours? I also started out a Roman Jerry girl. Like, I really did. Like, and I still am. Like, I still am. But I ended a true Ken Stewie girl. Like, 
Yeah, it's not black and white, right? Like, I love them yeah. both. But I'll tell you what. If anyone has any good Ken Stewie fan fiction, <laughs> you should send it to me or I will kill myself in front of you so that you will always have my memory as a permanent oh fixture in your life. And I mean that. I you mean that. You first. I will literally inhale these almonds and die if no one sends me <laughs> Ken Stewie fan fiction. For real. I will. I'll do it. So, Caitlin, was Kendall's name underlined or crossed out? I think it was underlined because it's the line starts off underneath his name Mm -hmm. and then it gets crossed off and he's an old man and he was not in his best health he could have easily just like missed and just like moved his hand up but i think just like the way that it starts underneath like i feel like if he was going to be crossed out it would have the line would have started a little bit higher you know so that's my argument for underlined but i fucking love this detail so much because i love this debate I love it. I love that we don't know. I'll tell you what. I think I'm in my prime health-wise, which is not great news, but I still (laughs) underline things like that. I have to use a ruler to underline things so they don't look like that underline job did. Um, Remember in BBC Sherlock mm, when... Don't do that. (laughs) Whatever you're going to do, When he said this woman was an alcoholic because of the scratches by her phone charge charger because she would miss the little pluggy any part of her uh, phone every time she went to go plug in her charger i am quitting i am not gonna do this <laughs> podcast with you if you bring this shit up every fucking time <laughs> i'm haunted by visions of him okay <laughs> oh yeah I, I do remember that i hate everything about that yeah. all the time yeah. that's what i was talking about earlier when i said like i feel like when a show's like Gotcha. I was I was talking about yeah. Stephen Muffin and Matt Gatiss. I literally immediately thought of Stephen Muffin and Mark Gatiss. Yeah. yeah. Fuck those guys. I've said the same thing always. Like I really like yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, you're right, left to right, that makes sense, right? Um, but mm-hmm. I agree with you. It's like do you remember that like, I think this is the last time we had like a a, a good solid discourse about anything in like the <laughs> late two thousand tens with the the gold and white or blue and black dress. Oh um, yeah. <laughs> it's like that, and I love that. Like Or or Yanny or Laurel. Oh my god! Oh my Which god! I always heard both, so that's I don't I even fucking remember what it sounded like. Yeah. I think like th- I love some good mm. unserious discourse. So me too. Yeah, it's it, great. Excellent. Okay, then it's time for us to talk about our peaks and valleys for this show. Um, so t- typically we have two peaks and a valley. Mm-hmm. What's your first peak? I came into this show late, and that didn't mean that I didn't see anything. Like I like I'm on Tumblr. I would see like pictures of the show. Like I'd see all the memes. But I had no context for them. Mm-hmm. And I also, because like I knew I eventually wanted to watch this show, I'm like, I, I would just scroll past it really quick. So I wouldn't get any context. I wouldn't know what the heck was going on. I didn't even know the names of these characters <laughs> mm. for the most part. So even though I came into this show so very late, as in I started this show when season four was airing, I remained absolutely unspoiled for the entirety of this show including all of the big season four stuff like i didn't know that logan was gonna die until i watched that episode and i watched it myself like i didn't know anything about the funeral until i watched it like i like that is the biggest peak for me because i hate being spoiled things so much like i i hate it it's like like i just want to experience things as they experience like even trailers nowadays like i'm hesitant to watch because they give away so much and the entire movie (laughs) literally and like like even even now like trailers will like show like snippets of the trailer as you clip as you like you click on it and then it'll be like here's the trailer for this i'm like yeah i know i clicked on it like Mm -hmm. i know what this is just get to it like you don't need to like spoil the trailer for me (laughs) so like i'm just so glad that like in this day and age of like spoilers being abound and people just not giving a shit about tagging things correctly that i never was spoiled for anything and it just is a huge peak for me because even though I didn't get to watch most of it live except for the finale it still felt like an organic experience to me because I had no idea what was going on ever Mm -hmm. and I didn't know what to expect and I didn't have anything to go off of I didn't know that oh yeah Tom portrays Shiv in season three I didn't know oh Kendall um throws Logan under the bus at the end of season two like I didn't know anything I didn't know anything and it was just such an incredible viewing experience for me um i haven't like binged a show like this 
I, I was going to say, like, I haven't been to shit like this in a while, but, like, also, like, I binged, like, all of Severance in one day. But I'm talking, like, multiple seasons of a show, you mm-hmm. know? Where, like, I feel like most of the shows lately I've been watching have been, like, current and, like, yeah. airing or, like, on Netflix or whatever, like, currently. So to be able to go back and watch a whole show that has already existed, that has years under its belt, and to still go into it, like all brand new not know anything it was a great experience and like i am now living vicariously through my brother who i convinced to start watching this show um and i just i wish i could watch it all again i think it is one of the greatest shows i've ever that that ever exists and i'm just glad that it was spoiler free yeah i was really rooting for you especially (laughs) after logan died i was like oh fuck like this is everywhere she's gonna fucking see it because no one Mm -hmm. can keep their little gross wet mouths shut like <laughs> what are we gonna do and you you prevailed i'm very proud of you for this. i persevered i did it <laughs> what um, about you what was your first peak i think it's that i think it's just the collective experience of viewing succession mm-hmm. like, not to give anyone who's watching it after air fomo but <laughs> I think to have watched season four live and especially the finale live and experienced it alongside millions of people is one of the greatest things that has happened in a long time to me. And it is, <laughs> I think it's it's estimated that 2.9 million people watched the finale live on Sunday night um, wow. of this year, May 28th. And this doesn't take account for delayed viewership. That's like an entire country all at once. <laughs> watching one show and Mm -hmm. the social media commentary was incredible the discourse the memes the art that came from the art i i -hmm. don't disagree that we experienced perhaps one of perhaps one of the greatest american television shows ever live right so that was great like yeah no no notes um Mm -hmm. i think i i I think after a global pandemic, it is so easy to crave, like, community and, like, the the experience of coexistence. Mm -hmm. So it was, like, one of those coexistence moments for me that I think I'll probably hold to dear forever and ever and ever, you know? Yeah. I'm so glad that they're, like, I know they're all on streaming, but, like, the fact that even streaming shows are airing weekly now so that you do have that chance for, like, that water cooler talk. Like, everyone's watched the same episode at the same time it's just mm-hmm. fun it's I, it's more fun to me yeah oh absolutely. absolutely and i'm glad that we're getting back to that yeah i agree what was your second peak we talk about a lot about the writing of the show but i also want to talk about like the directing of this show and like specifically how this show is shot uh, first they f- they shoot on film which is incredible and um it's why it looks so good and it, yeah. it, I'm just so happy that they do that but I love the style of it like I love that it had a mockumentary type feel but it also wasn't at all like I think at first like the first like zoom into somebody's face like kind of was jarring to me where I was like what huh like is somebody gonna start looking at the camera and start like talking <laughs> like mm-hmm. like what is this but like very quickly like you kind of forget about that i just liked that they had it so that the camera operators were in the room and they would swing to any person at any time to get their reaction no matter like they literally like i'm pretty sure um i read it they just kind of trust the camera operators to like grab whoever they need to or whoever they feel is right in a scene and um it, it to me it just made everything feel more real like there's so much about this show where it's just like yeah that's how real people talk and it's like it's because like you never know when the camera's gonna be on you like you have to be in character the entire time there's no like over the head I mean there are some but like generally there aren't like over the head shots where it's like oh you're not on your backs to the camera so you don't have to give it your all if you don't need to I mean like maybe do it for your scene partner but like yeah. If you don't know when the camera is going to be on you or it might like turn to you to just get your reaction to something like you have to be on. So I think that one to the actors gives them a lot of credit so that they always have to be thinking. And also just like it it just made you feel more of like a fly on the wall yeah. in a lot of the scenes. And then also to go along with that, I, I guess my second peak is just how like real these characters felt because of the camera operation and then also 
the improvisation that would happen. I was watching a video where it was like a script to screen scene from the end of season two and where you're watching the script like scroll along as the dialogue is said. Some of the lines are exact but for most of the lines it's like just a general idea of the line and then they just say words around it and it flows so much more naturally Mm. where it's not like we're reading a script and this is what we would say. It was just it felt more naturally as to like what the character would say off the top of their head and it's because of their um or uh or like but it's not just that it's just like they make it feel more natural and I just I just thought that was really really interesting like what they would do with these incredible incredible scripts but still make it feel so good (laughs) and real i agree on both your points because Mm -hmm. i mean for one like i like i like that camera movement style because i think it's invasive i think it's like yes invasive Invasive to rich people you know yeah yeah I, I agree with both your points because I think I think you're absolutely right first about the camera angles. I think like camera operation and like the diff like the, the, the mockumentary style in this specific context is invasive to rich people. And mm-hmm. yeah, that's what makes it work, work so well. It's like it's it's like putting a um, magnifying glass on what these people are actually like and what they actually are, um, mm-hmm. instead of letting them exist in their castle tower. So I agree with you there. Um yeah. And then, yeah, like, I think the improvisation paired with each individual actor's, like, theatrical training is, it works so well, like, so much better than I think yeah. shows do where it's like, maybe that character, maybe that actor doesn't have theater training. And then maybe they're not really improvising with the script. They're just reading things line by line. And because they're reading things line by line, it's just not natural. It's not natural sentence structure. Everything's coming out kind of like, quippy but in like a a natural like like in in like a well that just happened sort of like yeah Yeah. way so i completely agree with you another thing that i liked about this show and this is my second peak is Mm -hmm. no arc completion and i believe this and i will stand by this um Mm. i don't think a single character completed their expected arc and on this show and like we talked a lot already about how it's an unexpected show but I really I like that each individual person like if there was any progress or growth in their character if their character had any development it wasn't substantial like Mm -hmm. there were so many setups in this show for different possible outcomes and character development that hinge on one person breaking the cycle and changing the way the game is played and the writers basically said no that's not what Mm -hmm. the show is as we've been saying, but, you know, like, this idea that, like, Greg is going to, like, rise up through the ranks and fire Tom, or that, like, yeah, no. Shiv is going <laughs> to girl boss her way to the top, or that Kendall is going to have it all, or that any of them are mm-hmm. are going to actually break the cycle that their father... Connor will become president of the United States. Right, exactly. <laughs> like, that, you know, like, I really just love that. I love that no one really learned anything. Like, yeah. that is a good tragedy. When no one... Co- I... I I, th- I think that little smile at the very end from Roman is, like, the very one itsy-bitsy little glimmer of hope that we get from anybody. But Literally, like yeah. Other- and, 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 and even with his progress, I love that it's just, like, he kind of works up the nerve to ask his father if he's a cunt and start breaking away from him, and then he mm-hmm. dies, which is, like, yep. whoops, fuck you, Roman, <laughs> you know? So I really, I love that there's no art completion because I think, I think that we don't always have to learn something. I don't think, right. I think that, I think that the, I think that the characters don't always have to become better people in order for the show to work and to, to, mm-hmm. to feel like there's closure at the end. In fact, I think that there really isn't closure is what makes the show better. Yes. Yeah. I agree. What's your, just out of curiosity, what's your valley for this show? That does not exist. Okay. <laughs> I I was going to say, like, sometimes, like, when I don't have a valley, I'm just like, I just wish there was more of the show. No, I don't want more. No. I thought this was a perfect show. Like, I wouldn't change, a th- like, even some of my favorite things. I'm like, I wish, like, this could be, it could have been different. I don't want any more of the show. I would rather leave wanting more than it continuing on and it turning into shit like most shows do nowadays and I respect the writer so much for being like nope 
And there was even like a point where I guess Jesse Armstrong was just like, oh, well, we could have a season five because even some of the actors didn't know if this was going to be the last season or not when they were filming. Yeah. And like he was like, oh, this is what could happen. But then they just ultimately decided to end it where they did. And I respect it so much because I think things need to be left up to interpretation more, especially if it feels like the main story is complete. And just because a show is successful does not mean that it needs spinoffs. It does not mean that it needs prequels. I think sometimes those kind of diminish the original art of the show that you loved. And it sometimes ruins it. And where it's like, oh, I can't go to the original show because now I'm thinking of all the bad stuff that happened afterwards. Yeah. (laughs) And I like this show to me is a four act play. It is a four-act Shakespearean tragedy, and if it ended any different, it wouldn't be as good. And that's why, like, in hindsight, everything that happened is just like, of course that happened. Of course that happened. And it makes sense, but it's also shocking, but it's also so good. And I genuinely don't have any valleys. Yeah, I I feel like less is more, for sure. Yeah, what about you? Yeah, I think... I think I'm kind of in the same page where it's like I I definitely agree with you that I don't think I could bear another season of this like emotionally but also it would just be I think it would potentially cheapen the overall storyline what I will say I think what makes me sad is that this is so hard for showrunners to duplicate the reason I go back and forth is because this is a really special show and I think that some things deserve their novelty otherwise Mm -hmm. they wouldn't be special but what I will say is I don't know how sustainable it is for us to just continue to like do what you've described and like create remakes and like create you know additional seasons of a show that probably should have ended three seasons ago and you know create even original things that are only somewhat thought out Mm -hmm. or in like not executed I just I think that the fact that everything came together here is beautiful and wonderful like the actors worked the writing worked the cinematography worked like there are no complaints there are no notes that is Mm -hmm. so rare and that makes me sad because with how much money that goes into creating media you'd think that i mean you think that things would would work better you know yeah i think that's kind of my valley is that i don't know if we'll ever see anything like this again and on that note i think that like the transition at the very last bit of the show from hbo max to max kind of (laughs) symbolizes that we may very well be seeing the very end of of prestige television and i hope not i'd like to believe that people said that years ago when the sopranos finished airing i'd like to believe that people have said that said that at the end of you know other popular shows from the 90s but Mm -hmm. i don't know because it's gonna i think it's gonna be really hard to beat this there are good shows i mind you but i just think this is this is exceptional. You, you can't. Not as good as succession. You cannot duplicate this, um, mm-hmm. which means I will never feel this joy again. <laughs> <laughs> this is stupid because I was just thinking about how dumb it is that we've spent this entire like two hours reading about <laughs> this show and now we're going to read it. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> what do you think we're going to say? Um, no. But I'll ask the question anyway. Yeah. Uh, Caitlin, on a scale of one to five Lana Del Rey songs on my Kendall Roy playlist, Oof. how would Only you rate five? Succession? Uh, five out of five, obviously. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> obviously. Um, as you said, I it's, it is hard to duplicate, and I don't know what could be as good as this. I think this will take the cake for the best show that I've watched this year. I think it's going to be one of the best shows that I've watched in 10 years. I, you can't do this again. <laughs> you yeah. can't. And it's because nothing will hold up. Because even if you try to do something like Succession, you're going to have to compare it to Succession, which is already the greatest. Yeah. And what they created, um, everybody involved, this is so, so special and so, so good. And it. I think it's also been rare lately where... A show that's been going on for a bit ends and it's satisfying yeah and it's good and it's well thought out um and i think it was really nice to go into the finale 
not having to worry about um oh my god what if they actually changed it and greg won (laughs) for no reason or what if they there was another thing i really liked about the show is that it never i felt like catered to audience expectations like they they were telling the story that they wanted to tell yeah and i think um it should be like that more often and you can't do this again and it's five out of five it is the best show i've ever seen ever yeah yeah i i agree with everything um five for me as well yeah yeah we did it we talked about succession we Um, made it (laughs) thank you for listening to our two-part uh succession therapy session i don't even know what you would call this (laughs) Um, our excuse to get um all of our thoughts out of um, the audio messages that we send to each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, two girls who have a podcast <laughs> two, <laughs> finally make a podcast. Yeah, yeah. Us <laughs> podcasting to each other and then coming online and podcasting <laughs> performatively for all of you. Yee, um, when you see us next, we will be talking about what we do in the shadows uh, on FX. <laughs> I'm so uh, excited! The new series is coming out July 13th. 13th. So we'll see you then. Bye, Bye, bitch.